Welcome to our live social network video stream viewers. I'm Joseph Clark and this is Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're going to be going live to air for our radio broadcast in approximately 10 minutes time. Our guests this evening are UFC fighter and participant in the Ultimate Fighter, Saba Hamasi. Also, world champion boxer and world champion kickboxer, Bridget Baby Doll Riley. And martial, uh, master martial artist and coach to the American Gladiators and trainer of world champion kickboxers, Master David Crapes. So we have three guests this evening. We'll be getting the show underway in approximately uh, nine minutes' time. Welcome to our latest syndication affiliates, TalkStream Live, Android TV, and Chromecast. Martial Arts World Radio connects with audiences through distinctive and compelling guests and content across radio, online, and mobile platforms. If you would like to add your station to our network, or if you would like to advertise on the show and sponsor our celebrity fighter interviews, get in touch with me by email at producer at mawradio.com. Again, this is Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark. We're going to get our live radio broadcast underway in approximately nine minutes time or so. Our guests this evening are UFC fighter and participant on the Ultimate Fighter, Saba Hamasi, world champion kickboxer and boxer and uh, stunt woman, Bridget Baby Doll Riley, who's also worked on the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Million Dollar Baby, and all sorts of other great films. And uh, champion, world champion martial artist, Master David Crapes, who is a coach and trainer to world champion kickboxers, also a coach and trainer to the American Gladiators, and he himself is also a world champion kickboxer, as well as classical competitive martial artist. This week's inspirational quote is from Mahatma Gandhi and will go as follows. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Mahatma Gandhi. Today's interviews are brought to you by Kayani Independent Distributor Daniel Jarej. Kayani is a leading provider of all natural health and wellness products that provide athletes with faster post-training recovery and energy. Endorsed by professional fighters and celebrity martial artists, Josh Tyler, Manny Pacquiao, and Jackie Chan. Reach out to Daniel for more info at Australia at gmail.com. Don't let the Australia fool you. He ships his product anywhere in the world, so feel free to reach out to him at Australia at gmail.com. You can also Skype Daniel at Australia at gmail.com. The same address on Skype. Kayani, by the way, is spelled K-Y-A-N-I. Kayani Health Australia at gmail.com. Our interviews are also brought to you by ketone specialist Regan Bremersch. Keto OS is leading a modern health revolution through therapeutic ketone technology. Mix this great natural 100% bioidentical ketone powder into a 16 ounce uh, bottle of cold water for a great tasting drink for peak performance. Within 15 to 30 minutes, you will be in the optimal training and fight state of ketosis. He doesn't just say it can do it, he can prove it. For more information, contact Regan at 1-204-522-0733. As a matter of fact, you can text him or call him right now at 1-204-522-0733 or visit www.proveittoday.ca. That's www.p-r-u-v-i-t, number 2, d-a-y, dot c-a. Once again, this is Martial Arts World Radio. We're going to be getting the show underway in approximately seven minutes' time with our live radio broadcast. Our guests this evening are UFC fighter Saba Hamasi, world champion kickboxer and world champion boxer Bridget Baby Doll Riley, and also the trainer of, Mar of uh, world champion kickboxers as well of the, as a trainer of the American Gladiators, Master David Crapes. Those are our three guests for this evening. few items for you to check out when online check out www.bobwallworldblackbelt.com the world's foremost online martial arts and MMA marketplace also check out prospect fighting championships at prospectfights.com lastly google the books the Tao of MMA TAO the Tao of MMA and 21st century perspectives on martial arts both books are also available at Amazon by searching the Tao of MMA and 21st century perspectives on martial arts. Again, 
For those of you just joining us, this is Martial Arts World Radio. Our guest this evening, our UFC fighter Saba Hamasi, world champion boxer and world champion kickboxer Bridget Baby Doll Riley, and Master David Crapes on training the American Gladiators and also world champion title holding kickboxers. Welcome to our new web marketing affiliates, Everlast, Century Martial Arts, UFC Store, and MMA Warehouse. Check them out at our website at www.mawradio.com. If you go two-thirds down on the page, you'll see the uh, banner advertisements for those vendors. And if you click on them, not only do you qualify for a very competitive low price, but you'll also be supporting this radio show. And for that, I thank you. Be sure to check us out at www.mawradio.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and to YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark. This is Martial Arts World Radio. We are going to be getting the show underway in approximately six minutes' time. Our guest this evening, our UFC fighter and contestant and participant on the Ultimate Fighter reality television series, Saba Hamasi. Also, world champion kickboxer and boxer and stunt woman, Bridget Baby Doll Riley. And our third guest is Master David Crapes, who will be talking to us about not only the fact that he was a world champion kickboxer, but he has tra tra trained and coached dozens of world champion title holder kickboxers, as well as the American Gladiators. Thanks so much for joining us, and we are going to be getting our live radio broadcast underway in approximately five minutes' time. Yep, I'm getting both two and three. Uh, no, very clearly. All right, thanks very much. For those of you just joining us, welcome. I'm Joseph Clark. This is Martial Arts World Radio. Stay tuned. We're going to be running our live radio broad broadcast in approximately three minutes' time after some news and weather. Our guests for this evening are UFC fighter and contestant from the Ultimate Fighter reality television series, Saba Hamasi. Also world champion kickboxer and world champion boxer, Bridget Baby Doll Riley, who also is a stunt woman on the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, She's uh, taken direction by Clint Eastwood in her appearance in the film Million Dollar Baby. And she was also represented by Don King and she fought on Evander Holyfield's card at Madison Square Gardens. Our third guest this evening will be Master David Crapes, who is a world champion classical traditional competitor as well as a world champion kickboxer. He's also trained and coached dozens of world champion title holder kickboxers and the American Gladiators as well. We'll be getting the show underway in approximately three minutes' time. I'm Joseph Clark. This is Martial Arts World Radio. So glad you could join us this evening. Stick around. We've got a great show for you. One minute, 45 seconds. All right, very good. Break a leg.
finding a new leader, and if Manitoba MP Nikki Ashton wins the job, she'll be bringing along an addition. She is expecting a baby in November. The NDP leadership vote is in October. Nova Scotia Liberal Premier Stephen McNeil has covered hundreds of kilometers in a final push to win back a majority government tomorrow. From the Canadian Press, I'm Roger Ward. Here's Mark, Don, and Lisa from Leslie Motors. I don't think people realize how much vehicle inventory we have. I know, because we don't have our inventory all in one location, the old adage is out of sight, out of mind. But they can see all of our inventory at lesliemotors.com. Whether it's newer or vehicles, every vehicle is listed with pictures and incentives. If only we could teleport our vehicles like they did on Star Trek. What? Visit Leslie Motors in Harriston, Walkerton, and Wakeham, or lesliemotors.com. A pleasant drive from anywhere. Tonight, mainly cloudy with a 60% chance of showers and a thunderstorm, clearing near midnight. Wind down at the southwest at 20 kilometers, gusting to 40 to a low of 11. For Tuesday, a mix of sun and cloud again with a 40% chance of showers and a high of 19. Thanks, Sue. Looking ahead to Wednesday, the cloudy weather continues with a 40% chance of showers and a high of 14. You won't want to miss Hanover Community Players' spring production of Barrels of Persephone. This takes place on Friday, May the 26th at the Hanover Civic Theatre and runs for two weekends. Tickets are only $17, and for further information, you can call the box office today at 519-506-6902 or go to hanovercommunityplayers.ca. The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants Thanks, and not necessarily those of Blue Water Radio. Martial Arts World Radio is brought to you by Bruce County Combat <coughs> and Fitness in Washington. Check out the full list of classes at brucecountycombat.com. This is UFC fighter Jason Sago. You are now listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. I'm your host, Joseph Clark. Each episode, we speak to the biggest names in martial arts and combat sports, from the UFC, Bellator, the Olympics, as well as martial arts legends, pioneers, and cinema stars. We discuss best practices, expensive lessons, perspectives, and philosophies. Over the next hour, I will feature my interviews with UFC fighter Saba Hamasi on participating in The Ultimate Fighter, pursuing his personal best, and competing in Bellator and the UFC. A discussion with world champion kickboxer and world champion boxer, Bridget Baby Doll Riley, as she shares her experiences realizing her highest fight performance, being managed by Don King and fighting on Evander Holyfield's card, and working as a stunt woman on Hollywood sets. Lastly, we will speak with world champion martial artist, Master David Crapes on training the American Gladiators and coaching world champion kickboxers and the responsibility of training youths. Welcome to our latest syndication affiliates, TalkStream Live, Android TV, and Chromecast. Martial Arts World Radio connects with audiences through distinctive and compelling guests and content across radio, online, and mobile platforms. If you would like to add your station to our network, or if you would like to advertise on the show and sponsor our celebrity fighter interviews, reach out to me at producer at mawradio.com. This week's inspirational quote is from Mahatma Gandhi and goes as follows. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. Mahatma Gandhi. Today's interviews are brought to you by Kayani Independent Distributor, Daniel Jarej. Kayani is a leading provider of all-natural health and wellness products that provide athletes with faster post-training recovery and energy. Endorsed by professional fighters and celebrity martial artists Josh Tyler, Manny Pacquiao, and Jackie Chan. Reach out to Daniel for more info at Kayani Health Australia at gmail.com. That's Kayani, K-Y-A-N-I. Health Australia at gmail.com or Skype Daniel at the exact same address on Skype, Kayani Health Australia 
at gmail.com. Our interviews are also brought to you by ketone specialist Regan Bremersch. Keto OS is leading a modern health revolution through therapeutic ketone technology. Mix this great natural 100% bioidentical ketone powder into a 16 ounce bottle of cold water for a great tasting drink for peak performance. Within 15 to 30 minutes, you'll be in the optimal training and fight state of ketosis. He doesn't just say it can do it, he can prove it. For more information, contact Regan at 1204 522 0733. Again, you can text him right now or call him at 1204 522 0733 or visit www.proveittoday.ca. That's www.proveittoday.ca. Sabah Hamasi, born October 19, 1988 is an American mixed martial artist who competes in the welterweight division. Hamasi competed on the 21st season of the reality show The Ultimate Fighter, representing America Top Team. Formerly, he competed for multiple fight promotions, including Bellator. He made his debut with the Ultimate Fighting Championship on August 20, 2016, against Tim Means on the main card of UFC 202. He has a record of 11 wins, six losses. Saba, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Thank you for having me. Saba, tell us how you chose the nickname, The Problem. To my buddies that I live with, gave the nickname, The Problem. They're like, man, you're just a problem with everybody you look at it. So it kind of like just stuck from there. And so now you're presenting a problem to your opponents. Yes, sir. You have fought in both the UFC and Bellator. How did the two fight promotion companies compare from a fighter experience? Uh, it was both great experiences. You know, um, Bellator is a great organization, and so is the UFC. But of course, uh, I mean, now Bellator is more differently than, than when I was with them. So it's kind of like the strike force, it's like pretty much strike force all over again since all the same guys that run it. But other than that, I can't, you know, I have nothing bad to say about either or, both great companies. You participated on the Ultimate Fighter during a season that will probably go down in history, a very notable season. You were representing America Top Team. Tell us about that experience. Uh, it was great, man. You know, it was um, definitely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And, of course, I had to jump on board. And, uh, you know, you're locked in the house at 16. You're disconnected from the world, you know, no cell phone, you don't see your friends. Yeah, 757 at this point. Only benefit so was three minutes of talk. that uh, since it was team versus team, right, thanks very much. you were with your coaches and teammates, and you wouldn't have to fight each other. It was based off a point system, so, and no one got eliminated. So it was completely different than a regular season, which was pretty neat. Um, I don't think they'll ever do it again, but the whole experience is great, you know. Anything you wrote down on a piece of paper appears the next day. <laughs> Groceries or anything you need, just write it down and it's there. Um, and it was just, honestly, it was just another day. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't that bad. I'm sure the other guys that have been on other seasons will say it's, but their season was tougher because it probably was, you know. I'm training at my gym um, with my coaches and my teammates. Can't ask for anything better than that, you know. Saba, how long have you trained with American Top Team? Uh, I've been with American Top Team since 2008. It was very apparent when watching the television show that there was a brotherhood and a real sense of loyalty within the team. Uh, absolutely, it's great. You know, uh, you know, like you said, it's a brotherhood. We're smart when we train, and uh, we, just, we put in work. You know, it's just another day in the gym, so go in there, we train together. And uh, all the day, take care of each other at the same time, you know. And what does your training regimen look like presently? Uh, presently, I'm training, you know, two, three, four times a day. So I'm just constantly in the gym, preparing for the next fight. Uh, my coaches, you know, I have great people on board with me, so they know when I need a break, if I need a break. So they'll come in session if I need to, depending on how my body feels. Um, so, you know, recovery is very important, so I'm on top of my ice bath and training and my 
diet so everything's on point and running smoothly. Are you able to balance relationships and a social life while training to be a world champion? Absolutely. Doing it right now. Saba, would you elaborate on this point a little bit? Because we do a lot of interviews with both UFC fighters and former world champions from uh, kickboxing and full contact karate. And a very common answer that we get is that they had to learn how to balance their relationships or relationships suffered in the pursuit of becoming a champion. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Well, you know, it kind of comes down to your partner as well. So my girlfriend is um, very supportive of what I do. So she understands, and uh, she actually comes with me to some training sessions, uh, works out with me sometimes. And so it's main thing is you got to find someone who supports you and, you know, will do anything for you, and I have that. So she, she understands. She sees what I go through day in and day out, and... She's just very supportive of that. So, you know, I come home and, um, you know, she'll cook my food up or whatever the case might be and just relax mainly. She knows I need my rest. So, but of course, on the weekend, we'll, you know, go to dinner, go to movies, we'll hang out with friends. You still, got, you still need a, you got to unplug from time to time, you know, and, um, and the sure. on Saturdays, you know, that's my day to wind down and disconnect from you know, the whole MMA team to disconnect my brain from fighting about, thinking about fighting, and yes. uh, spend time with my girlfriend. Sabe, it sounds like you have a good partnership there, and she's giving you a lot of great support. Yeah, definitely. With all of the fight promotion companies that exist now, and with all of the many fighters in the UFC, is it becoming increasingly more difficult to stand out and be noticed as a fighter? Um, you know, I think it all depends on your fighting style. If you're an exciting fighter, I don't think it's going to be that hard to be, you know, I don't think it's going to be hard for you to stand out. You know, you, you build a big fan base that loves your fighting style, and once you have enough attention on you, you will be recognized. But it is very hard, you know, it's not, it's easier said than done, but, you know, you just kind of go with it, stick with it, fight hard, and leave it out there every time you step into the octagon. Do you have hobbies that you participate in when you're not training MMA? Yeah, I love playing sports, man, but the only time I get to play sports is when I don't have a fun coming up. I don't want to do something stupid and get injured playing basketball or football or bat, you know, tennis or whatever it is, and then I'm, I'm out of the fight. So that's kind of the hardest part, but it's not like I have time to do that anyways, you know? But yeah, I love playing sports. And growing up, who were some of the influences in your life? I would have to say my older brother. <laughs> you know, everything he did, I did. So he had a huge impact on my life. So, Saba, who is your favorite martial artist? I've been on Bruce Lee, man. And that is definitely the most common answer I hear. You, you can't go wrong with that. But like, he's the man. No, you definitely can't go wrong with that. You definitely can't. Do you consider yourself a martial artist first or a pro athlete first? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a pro athlete. You know, I compete at the highest level, and um, it's not easy to get here. And once you do get here, it's, you know, the hard work just keeps coming because you got to bust your ass to stay here. And Saba, presently, who would be the most important or influential relationships in your life? I mean, people, my coaches, I guess, you know, a good relationship with your coaches. If you don't have a good relationship with your coaches, you're not going to, you're not going to grow as a fighter, you know. If your coaches don't like you, if you don't have a good relationship with them, they're not going to put the time into you. And do you have a philosophy that you can share with our listeners on overcoming defeat and learning from losses so that you actually come out of them stronger? Absolutely. Um, you know, if you... If you keep thinking about a loss, you'll never, you'll never grow. You'll never move on. You gotta learn how to put that behind you, learn from it, and uh, make sure you don't make those mistakes or you know whatever the case might be. You make sure that you, it doesn't happen again. Saba, what goals have you set for yourself for the near future? I'm aiming to be one of the best big martial artists out there. So um, 
I'm learning every day. I'm getting better every day. You know, I don't put, I don't limit myself. So I'm looking to become a world champion one day, and it will happen in my near future because I'm putting in the work. I'm putting in the time. I'm busting my ass on a daily basis. My hard work is definitely going to pay off. Saba, this is our wrap-up question, and I thank you very much for your time this evening and for your candor. As a fighter who is fighting at the highest level and who has accomplished so much already, do you have advice for our young listeners or our martial artists that are listening tonight who have their sights set on becoming champions and fighting in the UFC? Absolutely. Sacrifice. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Sacrifice a bunch, and it'll all pay off. Make all these sacrifices now, you put your hard work in, and it'll all pay out in the end. That's a promise. Stay away from anything that's a distraction, and just surround yourself with positive people. 15 seconds. And you'll be going down the right path. Saba, that sounds like great advice, not just for martial arts, but for any worthwhile pursuit. Thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time tonight. We wish you all the very best. No problem. Thanks for having me. Saba's amateur career consisted of four fights. He caught wind of MMA when he saw a commercial for a pay-per-view event. He attended the event and fell in love with the sport, enrolling in a local gym immediately. This has been an interview with UFC fighter Saba Hamasi. 91.3 91.3 FM, Blue Water Radio. Follow us on Twitter. Our handle or Twitter name is at Blue Water Radio. And like us on Facebook. We have loads of exclusive contests and giveaways for our followers. Join in on all the fun and check out all the latest news and information in the Grey Bruce area. So spread the word and follow Blue Water Radio to win. Bruce County Combat and Fitness in Walkerton offers recreational and competitive kickboxing and boxing classes for children and adults, as well as yoga classes. Your first class is always free to try. Bruce County Combat and Fitness offers single monthly memberships for as low as $45 and $67 for a family. Their drop-in fees are only $7 for most classes and just $5 for yoga and little warriors. Check out their full schedule at brucecountycombat.com. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They also sell a full range of fight gear and apparel. Here's Mark and Don Leslie from Leslie Motor. Hey, Mark, do you remember that song, We're Here for a Good Time, Not a Long Time? Yeah, what about it? Well, I was just thinking that's the way people might think when they're buying a car. No one really enjoys the experience. We're here for a good time. Hey, Mark, focus. Just think, Leslie Motors makes buying a car more of a joy than a chore. Just like the song says, when you visit Leslie Motors, you want to be there for a good time, not a long time. Exactly. Visit Leslie Motors in Walkerton, Hammerston, and Wingham, a pleasant drive from anywhere. Tired of hard water wreaking havoc around your home? Dry skin and lifeless hair? Dull and dingy laundry? Soap scum and spotted glasses, too? Hey, call your man. A call your water softener turns hard water soft every time. Soft water is the answer. Not cleaning products or detergents. Culligan saves you up to 50% on soaps and detergents while turning your laundry, bathroom, and kitchen brilliant. Arthritis is a serious disease that affects more than 4 million Canadians, including baby boomers and children. For many people, arthritis means pain and disability. But there are answers for those struggling with the disease. The Arthritis Society can help. We offer hope through education, support, and solutions with information and programs to make life easier. The Arthritis Society. Visit us online at arthritis.ca for help or to make a donation. Martial Arts World Radio is brought to you by Bruce County Combat and Fitness in Walkerton. Check out the full list of classes at brucecountycombat.com. Midwestern Ontario's best music mix, BWR, Blue Water Radio, 91.3 FM. Bruce County Combat and Fitness in Walkerton offers recreational and competitive kickboxing and boxing classes for children and adults as well as yoga classes. Your first class is always free to try. Bruce County Combat and Fitness offer single monthly memberships for as low as $45 and $67 for a family. 
Their drop-in fees are only $7 for most classes and just $5 for yoga and little warriors. Check out their full schedule at brucecountycombat.com. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They also sell a full range of fight gear and apparel. Hi, this is Michael Jai White. You're listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Thank you, Michael. I have a few items for you to check out online. Check out BobWallWorldBlackBelt.com. That's singular, BobWallWorldBlackBelt.com, the world's foremost online martial arts and MMA marketplace. Also check out Prospect Fighting Championships at ProspectFights.com. Lastly, Google the books The Tao of MMA and 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts. Both books are available at Amazon by searching the Tao of MMA and 21st Century Perspectives on Martial Arts. Our interview with Master David Crapes is brought to you by Kayani Independent Distributor Daniel Girage. Kayani is a leading provider of all natural health and wellness products that provide athletes with faster post training recovery and energy. Endorsed by professional fighters and celebrity martial artists Josh Tyler, Manny Pacquiao, and Jackie Chan. Reach out to Daniel for more info at Kayani Health Australia at gmail.com. That's K Y A N I, Kayani Health Australia at gmail.com. Or Skype Daniel at that exact same address on Skype, Kayani Health Australia at gmail.com. Master David Crape's martial arts career spans over 40 years. He is both a world champion classical competitor and WKA kickboxing champion. In 1987, he opened his own school in Encino, California. Along with being a formidable competitive kickboxer, he has trained several world champions himself. He has also trained some of the cast of the television program American Gladiators. We recorded the following interview while having a coffee together in Bob Wall's kitchen in Tarzana, California. David, thanks very much for speaking with us today. So tell us about your training with some of the contestants of American Gladiators. I was fortunate enough to have met uh, Johnny Ferraro, uh, who is the producer and creator of American Gladiators, and he introduced me to his partner, Dan Carr, and they asked me to come out to uh, Orlando, Florida, and participate as a, uh, I guess you could say, kind of security slash bodyguard slash you know, uh, referee. <laughs> and I ended up getting to meet all the gladiators for the first time, and what a great career I've had because of that. And uh, it was enjoyable. It was a, the best two years of my life. Very good. But as I understand it, they, uh, they came to you voluntarily to train with you. It wasn't as though the show had hired you for that specific purpose. No, they didn't really hire me for that uh, specific reason. The reason why they hired me is because of my background as a martial artist. And, uh, they, they wanted me to handle all the security for them, and so I said, yeah, why not? What, what a great opportunity. So when I showed up there, the gladiators heard that I was a martial artist, so a lot of them jumped at the opportunity and said, hey, Dave, can you train me? And I said, sure, why not? This will be interesting. I, I love athletes, first of all. I think they're, you guys are all from different walks of life, and, you know, they're football, it's football players, baseball players. You know, track and field stars. Uh, I, it, it was amazing to me the type of uh, level of these uh, athletes that I, I was working with, and they picked up so quick. And it was something that I just enjoyed doing. And so we ended up on American Gladiators Arena on the on the middle of the floor. Where we, you know, you know the, the contestants and the gladiators were all out there with me, and we just kind of started learning Muay Thai. And I, and I loved teaching them, so it was fun, and it just an experience yeah, on that in the envelope. How many of the gladiators trained with you? Oh, there was probably, uh, I would say, half of them. Did any of the gladiators have formal martial art training in their background before this? You know, uh, I think Dallas was about the only one that really had any kind of background in, in, in martial arts. She loved to fight, you know. She became, we trained pretty hard, her and I. We used to uh, pretty much, you know, we'd go to her place and we'd uh, end up in her garage. She set it up like a gym and we'd sit there and we'd work out, you know, a few hours at a time. But she ended up uh, taking that to uh, the toughest woman in the world contest. And she 
you won it twice. Do any of the American gladiators still train with you today? Uh, about the only one uh, is that really does train with me is uh, that comes that, that comes around once in a while is Dallas. I mean, we stay we stay really close. In fact, she's in Florida right now. And she's coming out this way. Uh, she got sponsors. Can go in Hawaii for a big fight show. She's got a couple of her fighters that she's training now, and uh, she took it to a different level. She just fell in love with it. So now she's she's boxing, Muay Thai, and, and MMA, and she's got her own gym and she's doing the same thing. I, and it's great because it's great to see people that you that you care about and that you've worked with in the past turn this into something that's a lifestyle. And and what they do with it is they help others, and, and that's what we're supposed to do. You know, as, as a pioneer, I think I'm a pioneer because of all the years I've been doing this, that I had a lot of students that were out there and they're training people today. And I watch those students that come by, they bring them in and say, what do you think, uh, coach? And I go, I'm amazed. You know, it, it blows me away how well they, they, they've uh, taught them and, and how much knowledge they've learned from teaching. Because that's when you really learn is when you're teaching somebody. You gotta start analyzing what you have, uh, what was given to you from your mentors. And I have uh, two great mentors in my life, and I was very fortunate to have trained with Saxon Janjira, who is the legendary Thai fighter that came from Thailand back. And you can look him up on the internet. He's got all kinds of accolades. I mean, uh, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> Sometimes some of the things are funny. But, but you'll see on the internet, he's quite, he's quite an amazing character. And uh, you'll see me in his corner in a lot of his fights. And then my, my Hawaiian teacher, Kolomono uh, Kaibalu, and uh, I was been with him ever since I was a young boy. So it's, uh, a, it's just a, an amazing life that I've had. And I just can't even explain the, the career that I've, it, it's, it's helped me walk through the paths I've taken and, and the people I've met. It's just one step to another, another path, another path. And just open so many doors, and I'm just kind of feel this has been a blessing. You said a moment ago that you learn the more you teach. Would you say that somebody who is a teacher is has has an advantage over somebody who's never been an instructor in terms of progressing their skills even further? Well, there's two ways of looking at that. You know, sometimes I was very fortunate in my life. Uh, Cross paths with Ruben Rikidis back in the day, Benny the Jets' uh, brother. And uh, him and I worked together for a period of years in, the, in promoting fight shows and, uh, and opening up gyms. One of the things I remember him saying to me is when we were teaching fighters, he was saying, you know, Dave, and one of the questions that came up because it was a discussion we had, and he said that um, the best fighters that I've ever had were students who had a martial arts background. And, and the reason why is because they had a discipline around. It was easy for them to make a transition into kickboxing. And uh, that's what they were teaching back then. So knowing that has really, really, really uh, helped with people today that are teaching. So I think someone who's had a, a martial arts background, who's had uh, a history of understanding the body and then taking that to the next level of teaching, is a better, a better qualified instructor than someone who, who, who didn't analyze what they were learning. And, and, you know, it's like, you know, we used to laugh about it. Uh, taekwondo, take your dough, taekwondo. And then you get a, you go, you get a guy that, that, that learns for two years, gets a black belt, and go open up a, a, a dojo. And to me, that's wrong, you know, because he really doesn't understand the foundations or the, or the, or the, uh, the, the martial art, the whole spectrum of the martial art, because you really have to understand what, it's, what, what you're putting somebody through. And you can take somebody and teach them wrong, and then they get into a situation they get hurt. Giving a black belt to somebody that, that, that isn't qualified to have a black belt, why would somebody get a black belt if they, if they really don't know how to protect themselves? And, and, and putting a black belt on a kid I mean, to me, that was wrong because if you have a, a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old black belt, maybe to another kid he's going to be bad, but to an adult, you know, what's he doing with it? You know, it, it, it kind of puts him in a situation, and then it puts him in a situation in school where if someone knew that he had a black belt, now you've got people ready to 
And let's find out if he really is a black belt. And I can see people picking on it. I've seen that a lot. So I, I've, I've learned throughout the years to be, I'm pretty judgmental, I would say, on certain uh, instructions in, in people because I see it even in our business today in the Muay Thai world. I see fighters out there today or teachers today opening up gyms, taking on students and teaching them, and I don't see the knowledge. And there is a, there is a thing about knowledge, and it really is important that what you teach somebody, is, especially if you're teaching them how to protect themselves, you should have a background. If you don't have a background and you've been in the business for a year or two and you go open up a gym, oh, this is easy because I can make money at it. To me, it's like having a McDonald's on every corner, and, and that's kind of a shame in, in, in my business and when they start doing that. And I see that a lot now. Does a child have the, the life lessons and the character lessons to be a black belt? Um, I think a child, when you get a child in your gym or in your school or your halal or your dojo, it's like giving, a piece, it's like giving a piece of clay and you take that piece of clay and you put it in front of you and you start to mold them. And you give them the things that you'd want, you know, the right, the right attitude, the right, if somebody walks in here, even today, my kids, they walk in, but even though they're learning Muay Thai and uh, they're learning kickboxing or boxing or, or, or jujitsu, whatever our programs in, are in the, in the school, the kids walk in, the first thing I say to them, I say to them, I said, when you walk in the gym, the first thing is you, is you bow. It all starts there. And, and, and they, all, they ask me, well, why? Just bow. And you have to trust me on, on this one here. And the kids look at me, okay, sir. So they bow. And I says, oh, my name is either coach or crew David or sensei or whatever you feel. Just come, you give me a title and you call me coach, it's okay. But the most important is you never call me by my first name in front of people. And I said, so I want that as a, as a life lesson from the beginning. And now the kids, they walk in, they, uh, hello, sir, they salute, and they, they walk in and they show some respect. And when they walk on the floor, they bow again, they walk on the foot, then they start to train. And before they even start sparring or something, they always bow first. And it's just tradition and maybe it's old school or whatever you want to call it. But it starts there, and then as you groom them as they go, what you get back from them is much more than just fighting, and much more than just, you know, uh, I'm going to teach you how to fight with weapons, or I'm going to teach you how to, how to beat somebody up, or how to protect them. It's what they get out of it to teach their children. Because what I see today, and our world today, and what I'm watching on, the, because of the internet, and all the stuff that's happening, it is really hard to engage into the politics of today, but it's better to engage from a different corner, from a different place, a small, I have a small little place, so I, I engage my world with those kids, and I start there and say, that's what I get back. That's all you ever can do. And hopefully those kids will turn out the way you want them to turn out, and they'll be better people in the future, because you know what? There's this generation today I call the mad generation. <laughs> There's a lot of mad kids out there, and I, they walk into my, into, my, into my school, and I just, I have to almost close my eyes and say, okay, i got to think about this. How am I going to approach these kids and make them change? Because they come in with attitudes, and very young, you know, so that's where I'm at today as far as teaching goes. Sounds like you take teaching on as a responsibility. It is a responsibility. You don't want to have somebody learn something and go out and misuse it on somebody. It's not, that's not what we're giving these tools for. You know, uh, I, I don't look at that. I mean, I remember, you know, the only reason why I ever learned was because of that I was picked on so much in school and I ended up, you know, all the way from junior high school all the way to I graduated. It was like a war. You know, I, 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 I didn't even, there was, wasn't a week or a, a time in my life that I don't recall having, having to step into the, into uh, the, the field or into a, into a, a, a into a room somewhere in someone's backyard, you know, having to defend myself and fight one, two, sometimes six people. And I didn't like it, but I did it. And I ended up having to do that because I had to survive. And then I said, you know what? I'm gonna fight. And then somebody one day, you know, when I was at a, back in those days, we had, uh, in the 60s, we had 11s and, you know, the, you know, 
Hare Krishna and you know peace and all that and the war was going on but I remember as a as a 15 year old I was sitting there in some field and some guy walked by me and the place was packed with people big you know music going on everywhere and this guy walked by us and said hey and he said, you want to see me beat those two guys up over there that are picking on people and I said uh, he says what I, uh, why he goes, I just want to show you guys something he was recruiting I didn't even know he was recruiting so I said, sure, why not? And uh, so he says he walks and taps on these two guys' from, uh, shoulders, and they're big guys. He says, hey, you guys looking for someone to fight, right? And he said, they go, yeah. He said, well, fight me. I'm smaller than you, but I'll fight both of you. And I said, really? Well, next thing you know, we're behind the barn, and this guy's just beating the taillights out of him. And I said, I'm in. <laughs> so I joined martial arts at that point, and I've been at it ever since. David, do you teach multiple styles? Um, yeah, I do. So I teach uh, my Polynesian art. I'll always teach that to my students. I teach the concepts. I teach boxing because I boxed. Um, I teach uh, um, kickboxing because I kickboxed as, as a young guy. And then I, uh, I teach Muay Thai is what I train. I, I learn from my mentor, Saxon. So. Uh, those are the styles I teach, and then I have a, a jiu-jitsu friend. My hair, my stand-up is like jiu-jitsu, they go in the Hawaiian arts. But my, and then we go to the ground, but not like the jiu-jitsu guys. I don't believe I need to go to the ground. I'd rather run if I get a chance. <laughs> Do you have one prevalent foundation style? Not really. I, it's just whatever I'm standing in. And it's me reading the other person. I'm going to know what their, what their body language is. I study somebody's body right after that, and I know basically what they can throw from that, from that stance, or I, I read the way their body muscles tense up or something like that, and I know what to expect before it happens. So I'm ready. You know, I'm always that way, even at this age. <laughs> and tell us about your Polynesian style. Kind of, what we call the Hawaiians call it lomi lomi. The old school called it lomi lomi. The hands of massage. They learn massage, and from learning massage, they learn the, the, the muscles in the body, they learn the nerves in the body, they know how to manipulate someone's a body. Um, but everything is basically, they, they, if you look at the foundation of all martial arts, it's basically all the same, but it's how you apply it. And the principles of being able to hit somebody, uh, or strike somebody back, because you have to be almost in a, a defensive with an offensive move. And uh, basically, that's an Hawaiian style. And you want to take them, sweep them down, put them in a lock before they ever hit the floor. You know, as they're moving down, you want to have them in a lock. So when they hit the floor, they, they actually break themselves by landing the wrong way, or they, you know, they don't know how to land. But, yeah, it works. <laughs> I, I, mean, I hate to say it, but yeah, it works. <laughs> a lot of students today consider it a privilege to train under an accomplished master, but conversely, is it a privilege to teach? Being able to teach somebody and, and getting results as a teacher, I think, uh, is probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done. David, are there martial artists who you admire? I respect martial artists who have character. I love their characters. So the martial, I love who they are, but they're the right kind of uh, aura, if you want to call it that, but you'll, you'll see them, I, I, and uh, just so many, and, uh, I, and when you meet them, you know, you know, as a, as a, as a teacher, you know, as a, as a, uh, as one of the people who've been teaching for like, I've been doing this for, what, 48 years now? <laughs> a lot of years, so I see, I see a lot, and, and all, in all aspects, there's the boxing people, uh, I have my friends like Carlos Palomino, I just love to death, you know, and, and, and what a great inspiration he is to the, the world of boxing. And people like uh, my teacher, Colomona Cajivalu, he's the same way. I mean, I have my, uh, the people that I respect, you know, uh, they haven't, they never stop. And they're in their 80s, and they're still going, and they're still trying 30 to 30 seconds, yeah. Um, Saxon Jandira, I, I have to go back to him. From the beginning, the first time I ever met Saxon, I, I just couldn't believe the character he was and how much he loved his students. 
He loves teaching. He, lo he loves to share what he his knowledge. And it's all about community. And in this business, you have to have community. And without community, you can never, ever... Uh, Quiet, please. Uh, how can you share without it? Uh, and and you have to share your beliefs. And people stick around because of that. So I, I, I can say, you know, then you jet, I can go on and on and on. And, you know, it's never ending. And uh, Gene LaBelle... You have been listening to my interview with world champion and trainer of world champions, Master David Crapes. This is Emily from Ladan Reflections. Let us show you the wonderful, colorful new spring lines. Ladan Reflections has entered its second year with the support of all our customers. Whether it's casual Friday or a semi-formal occasion, we can outfit you. We have a wonderful selection of accessories. Come in to see Lisa or I at Ladan Reflections, 119 Garifraxis Street South in Durham. This area's fashion destination will make you look great so you feel fabulous. Rainwater. Why let it run away when you can store it for use in the summer? St. Matthew's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Hanover is partnering with Rain Barrel Canada to bring high-quality, low-cost barrels to Hanover and area. Each barrel holds 55 gallons of fresh, soft rainwater. And for only $55, you get the barrel, leaf and mosquito filter, spigot, tap, overflow hose, and adapter. For details and to order, go to rainbarrel.ca or call Bob at 364-1088. Your barrel will be ready for pickup at the St. Matthew's Yard Sale Saturday, June 3rd. Rainwater. Don't waste it. Use it. Your plants will love it. This is Norma Graham from the Hanover Public Library. Join me every Monday just after the 1 o'clock news for the Radio Book Club. From suspense thrillers to mysteries to romance and historical minutes, fiction and true minutes, stories, each week I'll be telling you about some great books you can enjoy reading that are available from your local library. The Radio Book Club is presented by Millennia Books. Your local independent bookstore has been located in the heart of downtown Hanover for over 50 years. Check out their great selection of new book releases, quality used books, jigsaw puzzles, healing crystals, and so much more. That's the Radio Book Club with me, Norma Graham, Monday just after 1 p.m., right here on 91.3 FM Blue Water Radio. Martial Arts World Radio is brought to you by Bruce County Combat and Fitness in Walkerton. Check out the full list of classes at brucecountycombat.com. BWR 91.3, the place to be. You're listening to CFBW 91.3 FM. Blue Water Radio, broadcasting from Hanover, Ontario. Blue Water Radio is owned and operated by Blue Water Community Radio Incorporated. Martial Arts World Radio is brought to you by Bruce County Combat and Fitness in Walkerton. <coughs> Check out the full list of classes at brucecountycombat.com. This is Olympic Taekwondo silver medalist Nia Abdallah. You are listening to Martial Arts World Radio with Joseph Clark. Welcome to our new web marketing affiliates, Everlast, Century Martial Arts, MMA Warehouse, and UFC store. Check them out at our website at www.mawradio.com. Our interview with world champion Bridget Baby Doll Riley is brought to you by ketone specialist Regan Bremersh. Keto OS is leading a modern health revolution through therapeutic ketone technology. Mix this great natural 100% bioidentical ketone powder into a 16 ounce bottle of cold water for a great tasting drink for peak performance. Within 15 to 30 minutes, you'll be in the optimal fight state and training state of ketosis. He doesn't just say it can do it, he can prove it. For more information, contact Regan at 1204-522-0733. Again, you can text or call him at 1204-522-0733. Or visit his website at www.proveittoday.ca. That's www.pruvit, number two, D-A-Y, dot C-A. Bridget Riley, born May 13, 1973, is a former female world champion title-holding boxer, a former world champion title-holding kickboxer, and current motion picture stunt woman. 
She fought in the super bantamweight division. She appeared in the Clint Eastwood film Million Dollar Baby, doubled for Haley Berry in Catwoman, and for Malik Ackerman in the comic book film Watchmen. She began her stunt career in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. She has also worked in productions such as The Glimmer Man, Ghosts of Mars, Scorpion King, Scary Movie 2, Constantine, and Serenity. Bridget, baby doll Riley. Bridget, welcome to Martial Arts World Radio. Hi. <laughs> oh my God, that introduction. I'm like <laughs> humbled. Well, Thank you so much for having me, Joseph. What a pleasure. And you are most welcome, and you've earned it. Bridget, what was your most memorable title fight? Was it kickboxing or boxing? Well, that's a really good question. Um, because, you know, my heart, my, my first love <laughs> was completely uh, karate, the martial arts, karate tournaments, kickboxing, and then boxing, of course. But um, I have to say it is my very first world title defense in boxing. I was defending my bantamweight ISBA uh, championship. And um, it was live on ESPN2, and everybody was watching, my entire family, and it was my very first defense. I'm like, really? It couldn't be like my 10th. It really this had to happen on my first. I got dropped, like, I mean dropped, the first round. And Richard Steele, who, you know, people in boxing know, he was a bit controversial, and um, he was a referee. So he easily could have stopped it. And I don't even know what happened. Honestly, I, I, uh, when you enter that realm as a fighter in the ring, uh, it's weird. It's a weird thing. You know, it'll make you or break you. And somehow I got back up. I barely made the count of eight. I don't remember getting up. I believe it was the hand of God. And Richard Steele looked at me dead, you know, dead in the eyes, and he said, are you okay to continue? And I was like, yeah. Well, I don't remember that. I have no recollection of that. Barely survived, I barely, barely survived that round. And I, um, by the grace of God, came back and I knocked her out cold in the ninth. And it was one of those, you know, one of those uh, <laughs> crazy fights. And at what age did you begin training in martial arts? Oh, good God, age. <laughs> um, it was a long time ago. I, I, I was a gymnast when I was little and my brother was in karate who, um, Patrick, Riley, who was like my hero, and um, I was I was a teenager. Uh, it was a difficult decision to choose to leave gymnastics because my parents invested. We didn't have a lot of money. We were very, um, you know, we we struggled, and we uh, everybody sacrificed in my family for my gymnastics. So, um, and I was going seven days a week. By the time I stopped gymnastics it was it was a full-time job I mean it was five and a half hours every day I had no life and I I loved it I I was the first in the gym and the last to leave every time but um I would go to my brother's karate tournaments and it <laughs> it was it was so cool and you know I just saw the camaraderie at these tournaments and the point fighting and the kata and the weapons and I was like mom and, and you know we would sit down as a family at at the table and have these family discussions and I said, you know, mom, and I was really scared and nervous and, you know, um, my mom was so awesome. She said, honey, if you're really done, let's, let's be done with it. You know, we're not going to push you. And I go, yeah, but you, you put so much money into it. And, um, she goes, what do you want to do? And I go, I want to do karate. I want to go to karate. And I was terrified. I, it took me, I went four weeks watching class, watching my brother at the dojo. And they kept saying, jump in, you know, come on, jump in, jump in. I was, I was really afraid. I'm not, I'm not too proud to admit that. And finally I just did it and I was home. I was home. I mean, it was just like, wow. <laughs> so I was a teenager and that's when I got my, you know, I started as a white belt and worked my way up from there. So tell us about getting the call from Black Belt Magazine that they were going to induct you in the Hall of Fame. What was that like? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was like, seriously, me? <laughs> There's so many better people. Um, it, was, it was amazing because I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, before I moved to California to train at the World Famous Jet Center, um, 
my brother and my dad would always shove these magazines, like Bust Belt magazine, all the magazines, all the karate magazines, in front of my face. And they're like, look at this cover. And it, I, I saw Kathy Long, you know, on the cover. And they're like, that, you know, you need to go there. You need to go to California. And so it, it was always my dream to go to California and to train with the best and then to be on a cover, which eventually happened, it took a while. But then, you know, just as a complete bonus, they inducted me and put me in. Um, it was um, extremely humbling and I was ex so thankful. And I'm still like, really? <laughs> like, just me? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if I deserve it, but it was really cool. So Bridget, well, my dad passed away, so he didn't get to see it. But I know he's in heaven, and I really feel him. Um, I feel him. I, I know. He, I know he's seeing it all. You know, but it, it, it's a bummer. You know, because God, he was he, he was like my number one fan, my biggest support, and he loved the entertainment industry, which I got into that just as a fluke and by total accident. And he would have loved that though. We would play Trivia Pursuit as a family and I couldn't even, like, I probably couldn't even get first grade level questions and my dad was on the main one and he could get every single entertainment trivia question, period. And I just, you know, there's a part of me that I really wish he was here to see it all. Bridget, why did you become a professional fighter? Hmm. Oh, how could I not? How could I not? Uh, it, it really is that thing. It's, I don't know what that is. I, I honestly have tried to figure that one out. But um, when I would be in karate tournaments, and karate, yes, it is a game of tag, but it would get rough. I mean, it would get really rough. And yeah, you, you hit, you gotta be fast, you gotta be first, and then you break, and they call for a point. But I loved it. I loved the camaraderie. I loved my brother and all his friends and the team and like just everybody in these karate tournaments. And that's how I got hooked. And I was just done. And I liked it. And I was good at it. And I, I liked being good at it. Because I wasn't very, um, I wasn't, <laughs> I was kind of a dork and a tomboy. And I had my big Coke bottle glasses when I was little. And, you know, girls made fun of me. And girls were really mean. And they were really mean to me. And I found something that I could do. And I could feel good about myself. And I learned confidence in the martial arts. And I learned dignity. And I learned respect and self-respect. I learned all these things. And, um, you know, alongside with my my family. And one thing led to the next. You know, I segued from karate into, well, I was getting disqualified. I like, I like to bang, man. I like to, I like to hit. I didn't like to stop. Like, let's keep going. What's the problem here? So that's when they said... Maybe you should think about, you know, um, continuous fighting. And Mr. Jim Boucher was my first um, kickboxing trainer back in St. Louis. Uh, we fought in Belleville, and he goes, hey, Baby Doll. He's the one that named me Baby Doll. He goes, you look like a little baby doll. He goes, and, and it just stuck with me. And he goes, you want to try kickboxing? I said, yes. My boyfriend was doing it. My brother was doing it. All the guys in the gym were doing it. Heck yeah. Let's do this. So that is when I was like, Yes, and there weren't, there wasn't amateur back then, and it was, you know, it was a while ago, and uh, yeah. if I wanted to fight, they were like, well, you, hey, guess what, you got to go pro, first fight, hey, no problem, and P.S., you're going to fight the U.S. champion, awesome, <laughs> I was like, let's go. No pressure. No pressure, but it was so, you know, it's funny, because, you know, you, I see, like, as, as the sport has progressed, and um, you know, through the years, I would, I would see girls, or, and, and, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, but I would, I would hear people, you know, because I'm in L.A., I moved to L.A., and, you know, you, you hear all these stories, and you, you hear these people, like, they want to they wanna pick their fights, or they want girls that, you know, I don't know, they dig them out of the ground. Like, I, want, I fought everybody at first. I mean, and not every fight was a war. Most of them were, and at first they definitely were. I was way in over my head a lot of the time. I think that builds character. I think you find out real quick you either have it or you don't. And you have the heart, you can't be taught that. You have it or you don't. Who was your toughest competitor, Bridget? Hmm. It's been quite a few of them. Um, oh, let's see. Bonnie Canino. 
absolutely in kickboxing. I remember watching her fight Kathy Long going the distance, and she looked really scary, and um, very scary. And I was like, whoa. And I, and I fought her the, the first time, and she beat me in my hometown. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. That builds character, though. Um, you, uh, I think some of my losses, my biggest losses were the best learning experiences in my life, and I wouldn't have moved to California had I not gotten my butt kicked and handed to me. So Bonnie Canino definitely, I rematched her and um, got taken out of that ring in a stretcher on the rematch, but I won two world titles that night, and it was 12 rounds, and it was amazing. Um, she was tough. She was really, really tough. In boxing, um, Yvonne Trevino, she was the champion. I took the title from her. You have to really be the champion to take their title away. She was tough. Uh, Brenda Burnside, when I fought at Madison Square Garden on Vander Holyfield Lewis won. Um, that was amazing. She was really strong. And you know what? You better have a good corner because sometimes when we're out there, um, I like to bang. If you put me in a phone booth, let's, let's do this. I like inside fighting. I don't like to move around a whole lot. Even though I have that. I have that in my back pocket from karate. Um, but uh, sometimes you really got to listen to your, your corner. And that's hard to do sometimes when you're in the ring because it's such tunnel vision. And you're so in this thing. And when you start getting thumped and when you start cracking on a girl that you're used to, well, in other fights, this punch dropped her or this punch really hurt her. And it's not even not even making a dent that takes you to another place as a fighter in that ring and you can't panic you can't and all these fighters that say oh i'm never nervous oh loney every time i've gotten in that ring i'm nervous i'm afraid of looking bad i'm not afraid of getting hurt that doesn't scare me i'm afraid of looking bad i'm afraid of losing and that motivates me Bridget, on this show, we have interviewed Lindsay Garbat, another world champion who transitioned from boxing to MMA. We've also interviewed your friend, Fridia Gibbs, who transitioned from kickboxing to boxing. What compelled you to transition from kickboxing to boxing? First, I want to say I love Fridia. We go way back together, and she is the reason I have this connection with you, Joseph, and I'm so grateful to her, and I'm so proud of her. As am I. She has her own radio show and her own book, and I'm absolutely inspired and um yeah she's a good girl man and, and an incredible athlete so i just want to give a shout out to her but um wow i'm sorry what was the question <laughs> why did you transition from kickboxing to boxing oh well i was in a heavily um boxing uh team my camp uh i moved to st louis with 100 bucks in my pocket drove out from st louis landed at the jet center the original jet center the world famous jet center on fire in van nuys california and i showed up didn't know anything all i knew is my brother said this is where you have to go if you really want to do this and i'm like hey, yeah um i show up there's a sign that says train for the day for 15 dollars i happen to get to see sunset benny the jet Yikitas there and i have my 15 i had it out so fast you know i'm like here 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 sir and um, he goes, put your money away. Keep your money. And he goes, well, what are you, you, know, what are you doing here? And I go, well, I'm here to become the world champion. And um, <laughs> that's who I trained with. And his sister, Lily, my mentor, my everything, and her husband, Blinky uh, Rodriguez, they took me over. They watched me spar, and they took me over. And um, that was, for me, like winning the lottery. That was, that was it. They said, if you're serious, uh, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to manage you. They were heavily into boxing. They had a really strong, I mean, they were around boxers. They were Hector Lopez. I mean, the like, like they were around constant boxing. They had, a, um, so my, my kickboxing training through them, uh, was a lot of boxing. So I think I had an advantage in my kickboxing fights because I had good hands. I had fast hands. I had really good combinations, punches and bunches. And I started seeing Christy Martin, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I need that. I, I, I need to be there. And I was hard. You know, like Blinky even said, God, i got to micromanage you. Like, I, I, was, I was, you know, we're fighters. We're, it, you know, you have, there's a certain sense of ego in that. You know, you, you want to have that humility, and, but you're, you're still, at the end of the day, you're a freaking fighter. And I'm like, I want that. Put me in there, man. How do we make this happen? So they're like, let's start putting you in 
kickboxing, and a lot of fights in kickboxing were falling out, and people didn't want to fight me. Um, the more and more I grew, and so we're like, hey, if this is an avenue to get more fights, well, let's do this. And Bridget, we're coming up to the top of the hour, therefore we have to close off the show. There's never enough time. We're just scratching the surface here. However, last question or two. Where does your strength come from? Where does my what come from? Your strength. My strength comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, 1,000%. And, um, <laughs> and I'm a very hard worker. Uh, you, you, uh, I have a very hard work ethic, and, and for some reason I've been with amazing people, wonderful, wonderful people who have uh, mentored me and taught me and trained me and schooled me and taught, and I am uh, a thousand percent grateful for all of that, and I have a, um, um, I ha my dad passed away, but I have an amazing stepdad and my mom. Uh, my family's tight and they're solid. Um, I have a very small circle on the loner, but but uh, it's really, really awesome. Bridget, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to having you back real soon. Congratulations on your legacy and best of luck on your further adventures. Thanks again. Thank you so much. God bless Joseph. I really appreciate it. And everybody listening, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Bridget's boxing fight record was 15 wins, 3 losses, 9 of her wins were from knockout. Her kickboxing record was 24 wins, 2 losses, with 15 of her wins coming from knockouts. This has been my interview with the great Bridget Baby Doll Riley. Be sure to check us out at www.mawradio.com and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube by following Martial Arts World Radio. I'm Joseph Clark, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much to our social network video stream viewers. This is Martial Arts World Radio. Be sure to join us next Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for more Martial Arts World Radio. Have a great week and thank you once again.